Good morning. It's a beautiful day to be out. And appreciate so much your attendance. If you're visitors, we appreciate you and uh, ask that you would uh, fill out a visitor's card so we'd have a record of your attendance. And also ask you to stay a few minutes after service so that we can meet and greet you properly. If anything has been said in one of the classes or during our worship or uh, Brother Rick's sermon that you have question about, please ask somebody. Uh, don't leave with a, a question mark. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that everything is, is plain and everything we do, we have scriptural reason for doing it. And so let us, uh, let us know, let us talk to you about that. On a good, great note, last night, uh, John, and I'm sure I'm going to mess your last name up, Fox, is that anywhere close, John? Was baptized into Christ, so we got a brand new brother today. And can't think of a better way to start the announcements than, than that. Wonderful news. Uh, we have many on our sick list. Hope that you picked up a bulletin. In addition to what's in the bulletin, Stephanie Skurlock is uh, one of John's friends, right? No? Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, Jason? It's okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, it's just my mind. It's left. Uh, please uh, pick up the bulletin. Keep it by your table or wherever you, you pray. And mention these people in your prayers to God. Prayer works, and we've got many people who are recovering from surgery, uh, many who are recovering from illnesses, and uh, prayer works. We need to always remember that. And thinking of uh, Joanne Lawrence is recovering at home and doing a lot better, and Samantha York has been moved to rehab after 40 some days on the ventilator and things. And so she is doing a lot better. And Roy is here with us, or he was. For, yeah, there he is. He's hiding behind Nacho. That's easy to do. And, <laughs> But we're glad that he's home from the hospital. He's suffering with pneumonia. Uh, his wife, Judy, is still a little under the weather, so continue to remember them in your prayers. We also have a, a number that are care-bound, that are unable to get out. Uh, and also remember those people, and if you got a few minutes, run by and say hello to them, I'm sure they would enjoy a visit, a card, or you know, just anything to let them know they're not forgotten. And so I think that's everything on my list. Also, let's remember our brethren in the Ukraine area. They're undergoing terrible things and uh, Hope that you brought stuff to be sent to them. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear, gracious, holy, heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful that we can come in such a free and open manner to worship you today with our brothers and sisters. We're thankful for that, Father, because many places in this world 
it is not this way. And dear Father, we pray that you'd be with our brothers and sisters who are meeting in areas where things are very bad. Give them courage, Father, to continue in their walk of Christian life. And help us, Father, to do all that we can to encourage. Dear Father, we pray for those who are listed on our prayer list as sick. For we know, Father, that you can heal beyond anything that we have skill with our finest surgeons and doctors. And dear Father, we pray that those who are recovering from surgeries will continue to recover. Those who are recovering from illness, Father, we thank you and pray that they have a full recovery. And dear Father, we have many on our prayer list, like Brother Marvin, who are in serious ways. And we ask that you would be with him and bless him. Dear Father, we ask that you'd be with our new brother in Christ. Bless him, Father, and we welcome him and help us to be a good example to him. Dear Father, we pray that you will continue to bless our children and our grandchildren. Keep them safe, Father. And Father, we pray that our worship today is acceptable in your sight. Again, we thank you for the good things that we enjoy in life because we know that everything that we have that is good has come from you. And dear Father, help us not to complain so much about our aches and pains, but to look to those who are worse off and be thankful, Father, for the degree of health that we enjoy. And dear Father, we pray for our government pray for our leader. We ask, Father, that you would give him wisdom to guide the nation in a way that is pleasing in your sight. We ask that you'd be with our military leaders as well, Father, and as they plan missions, we pray that the objectives would be clear-cut, that these would be things that could be achieved quickly with as little loss of life and injury as possible. Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country, knowing that they came at a great cost to human life. And Father, especially we're thankful for the spiritual freedoms that we enjoy that cost you your son on the cross for our sins. Holy Father, please forgive us. Help us to walk in a way that is pleasing in your sight. Please accept our worship. Be with those who are leading in worship. Bless them, Father. In all these things we pray through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Those of you that are visiting with us, if you did not get a visitor's card, we would really... I'd like for you to fill one of those out before you leave. Um, we'd like a record of all of your attendance. And it's already been mentioned, if there's anything that you doubt or have a question about, uh, either in Rick's lesson or what you uh, experienced in class this morning, be sure and say something to someone before you leave. Uh, both men and women uh, sitting here are more than able and willing uh, to help you with that. And if you have a desire for a Bible study, say something to someone before you leave, uh, and we'll see if we can't get someone to fill that gap uh, that will be acceptable to you. I do want to uh, give you a name to add to your prayer list. Uh, Millie Allen, this is Christie's grandmother, uh, has been taken to the hospital with a blood clot. So please add Millie to your, to your prayer list. And also, uh, lest I forget, 
Uh, there'll be no jail ministry today, and to those of us that uh, have gotten used to that, it's kind of like getting up and brushing your teeth or polishing your shoes before you leave. It just, it's become a way of life, and it means a lot, not just to those of us that are involved in that ministry, uh, but also to all those guys in, uh, incarcerated there. In other words, they look forward uh, to our being there on Sunday uh, as much or more than what we look forward to being there. In other words, uh, all they've got every day is what is there. And so a new uh, breath of fresh air, I guess, uh, come Sunday, they have the opportunity then to talk to someone from the outside. And what better thing to talk about than our eternal destiny? And they look forward to that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read just uh, a statement. This is a letter that uh, came uh, yesterday uh, from one of those individuals from the uh, jail ministry that is now in uh, our system. And I'm just going to read a, a statement here that, that struck me. If you'd like to read the whole thing, uh, you'll be welcome. Said, I talked to a guy that told me that all you need to do to get to heaven is to believe. Uh, John 3.16 clearly states, I shared verses with him uh, that you might be, that you must also be baptized as part of God's plan to save man. I'm so happy to have opened or helped open his eyes to the scriptures. So that's from an individual uh, that's been sentenced to serve 25 years for murder. And so as a result of, of the jail ministry, uh, here the Lord has an individual now that is teaching inside those walls where you and I, outside of Becky, Becky has a special uh, interest in that since she has all the Bible correspondence courses going that she's working with. But there's a good example of what's being uh, what is taking place through the jail ministry and everyone here that's praying for that work, that's involved in teaching, involved in taking and baking the, uh, the cookies and things we take to the jailers all have a part in that. And who knows, maybe, maybe from uh, this young man, uh, we'll be able to set up not only with him, with him already has been set up, Bible correspondence courses, but through him, maybe others that he can reach. Uh, there's no end to what the congregation here is involved in, both in uh, foreign mission fields and right here at home. So we need to continue to pray for uh, all of those works. And as I mentioned, John, uh, our new brother in Christ, if you've not got the opportunity to meet John, uh, he's sitting right over here in front of Jeff. Uh, so be sure and welcome him and also you need to make us aware john of any uh, things that we can do to help you in your spiritual growth we're all here to help one another encourage one another in order that we might all get to heaven so if there's a, a need that comes up then you need to let your brother and sister know i need a uh, i need an ear to bend or i need someone to spend some time with uh, let us be sure and let us know and not only john that goes for all of us who are God's children. We have a responsibility to ourselves uh, in our growth, and we have a responsibility to others in the example that we set in our lives. Also, as mentioned, uh, Stephanie Spurlock, uh, she's home after her uh, surgery, and apparently it went fine, uh, but says further information on her treatment as far as chemo, uh, is yet to come. We do not have any information regarding that, so we do need to continue to pray for Stephanie, keep her in uh, our prayers. Uh, and those that have been asking about VBS tonight, there will be a meeting after evening services uh, immediately after. So all of those that uh, want to be involved uh, or have any questions uh, about the VBS, uh, please uh, plan on staying a few minutes after services this evening. Uh, the date, I guess, is still tentatively set. Uh, 
July 11th through the 15th, as far as, as, far as I know. And ladies, uh, ladies day out, I want to make mention this because not all the ladies attend our ladies Bible class. Those of you that can and do, uh, I'm sure that is a, a great blessing for you. And I commend you for the work that you all are involved in in the ladies class, even in the jail ministry. Just like the note that I read from the one that's in prison now, our ladies are sending cards uh, to those individuals too. Uh, it's uplifting to them. Uh, I didn't can't. I just can't in, uh, encourage our ladies enough or thank them for the work that they do. But uh, the ladies' day out is not just only for those ladies in the ladies' class. That's for uh, the entire family here. So uh, ladies, March the 31st at 11.30 down here at J&L, if you'd like to share uh, that meal together. Also, I'd point, point you to in your bulletin the directory update, Rachel will be taking those pictures. The information is there. Um, so be sure and uh, get your photograph taken. If your, hair, if your hair was black when that was taken and now it's not quite as black, uh, it'd be easier to recognize, you know, if we get a new photo there. Uh, also, ladies' retreat, that'll be April the 22nd and 23rd at Jan's. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the back for that ladies' retreat. Uh, those that uh, plan to come, uh, please sign that, that sheet. And then for any further information, well, you can contact Jan and she'll uh, share that with you. Uh, and also, as Paul's already prayed for those in Ukraine, we need to keep those uh, on our prayers on a, a daily, daily basis. As already mentioned, uh, Wanda Cruz is doing better. I understand that uh, she's home. They've, she's having a hard time with the monitors. Uh, didn't ask why, but uh, she broke the first one, so we've got that replaced. So uh, she's still above ground taking nourishment and doing uh, as well as can be expected. We need to continue to pray for her as well as Joanne Lawrence. Uh, Missy Lewis. Not good today. Terrible, terrible time uh, already this day. So uh, pray you remember her. Brother Roy's back with us. We're thankful for that. Uh, I don't see Judy. Uh, I've always seen Roy as a man of wisdom. So when, you know, uh, everybody laughs when they said he's uh, sitting behind or hiding behind Nacho. Well, hey, if I'm going to hide behind anybody, nothing against any of you, but Nacho's going to be the one I'm going to get behind too. But Judy, I do not see her here, and Roy, uh, do not take this uh, except the way I mean it, since it's your birthday, but uh, Roy said she was having restless leg problems, so he gave her one of his pills. She didn't wake up this morning yet, so we need to uh, pray for her as well. And of course, uh, as Paul already mentioned, prayer does work, and we can see that with all of these that... Uh, are on our prayer list, Samantha York especially, and also I failed to mention, it is in the bulletin, but uh, Pat Cruz will be seeing a surgeon concerning her back, and I forget the date she told me, but it's this month. So all of those, be sure and remember uh, in your prayers. All right, as we begin our, our worship, bow and let's do so with a word of prayer. Father, how great and wonderful you are to look down on the height of your creation and see how we've fallen from your grace and yet even in that, Father, loving us enough that you were willing to turn around and Send Jesus that he might shed his blood to cover those sins that separate us from you. We pray, Father, you'll help us on a continual basis to realize that that come about because of the great love that you did have and do have for us. 
We pray it'll motivate us to be the kind of children that you would have us to be. We're thankful for the fact, Father, that we uh, can be and are your children and that you do bless us and that you provided for us not only in this life, but, Father, when this life is over, you have provided something far beyond anything that we can uh, hope or even imagine. We're grateful for that. And for the privilege we have uh, this morning to be able to assemble and to offer to you our worship and to do so according to what you have dictated to us in your word, we're thankful. And it's our prayer, Father, that we will always, always offer to you the best that we have. Recognize, Father, you're worthy of more than what we're able to give. Help us in our lives that we might emulate the love, Father, that you have for us. And that when we, we pray, Father, that opportunities will be sent our way, that we might share our faith with others. Give us the, the wisdom, Father, that we need to recognize those and, and the courage we need, Father, to share with them what we have done in order to accept your grace. Encourage them, Father, that they might likewise do the same. We're thankful to you, Father, this morning for John and for his willingness, Father, to surrender his life to you. And we pray that you'll bless him in that effort. And bless us as your children and as his brothers and sisters, Father, that you might use us to help encourage him in his growth. We pray that we might all, before we leave uh, this life, achieve, Father, that, that goal in, in our faith that you would have us to have. Father, we're thankful for Jesus. We love you for that. And we pray that you'll forgive us of our shortcomings. We humbly ask this in his name. Amen. About 8.30, I got a phone call this morning, and it was from Kay Dahlman. He said, I just got called in to work. Will you read my singing for me for this morning? And he sent me a song, so I go, well, I'll be. I know him. So, because I'm one for tonight. You got me a double dose today. But that's, uh oh, I shouldn't have said that because some of you won't come back now. <laughs> but we're glad to have you with us tonight, today. The first song is number 611. Number 611, Heavenly Sunlight. Now, notice, I, I, think, we, I think this word's misspelled. It shouldn't be S-U-N-L-I-G-H-C. It should be S-O-N-L-I-G-H-C, shouldn't it? Because we're walking the heavenly Son of God light. So let's, as we, with that thought in mind, let's sing this song. Heavenly Sunlight. Walking in sunlight over my journey Over the mountain, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal 
God Almighty, Father, we're so very thankful, Father, that you have given us the opportunity and the desire and the ability, Father, to be here today. Father, we're so mindful of those in Ukraine, Father, India, and other places that's been persecuted for different reasons. Father, we're mindful of those in the jail that, Father, would like to be able to worship you today as we're privileged to do. Father, just breaks our hearts to, to think that there's people in this world that desire and want that opportunity, Father, to extend worship to you and Father unable to do so for various reasons. And Father, we pray that those obstacles be removed and they may be able to worship you freely like that, that we have that opportunity. Father, we pray that our worship is acceptable and pleasing in your sight. And Father, that it's done in spirit and truth. And Father, it's done through the love and sacrifice of your precious son, Jesus. And we always bring to remembrance what you and your son have done for us. We never take that sacrifice for granted. Father, we're mindful of, of the many that's been mentioned by Paul and by Bob that's on our prayer list. Father, the, we pray for each and every one of those <coughs> on their physical needs, but most importantly, Father, we pray for those that's spiritually lost, Father, that either you do not know you or, Father, that's turned away from you. Father, we pray for not only our military and our civil servants, our police and firemen and doctors and nurses and those, Father, that 
continue to look after us daily. But Father, more important than that, Father, we pray for those men and women around the world, Father, that's sharing the gospel, especially those, Father, that's sharing the places that are in danger of their, their lives. Father, we pray that we strive to love you like you first loved us. Father, we pray for forgiveness of our sins. Father, as we strive to forgive others, and Father, give us the strength, wisdom, courage, and fortitude that our every word, thought, and action is according to your will and that would bring you honor and glory. Father, we know that we're weak at times and we sin and fail you and we humbly beg for forgiveness. Father, we would ask you to be of Brother Rick as he brings the lesson today, give him ready recollection of the things that he studied and prepared and that we as listeners would adhere those things to our hearts and minds and share them with others to the best of our ability. And we thank you for our elders, our deacons. We thank you for Rick and Kathy. And Father, as Bob mentioned earlier, we're so grateful for all that's involved here at the church and different ministries. But especially we're thankful for those, all those that's supported the ministry at the jail, whether they're physically going or they're baking goods or, or they're keeping individuals in prayers or sending cards or whatever that they're doing. Father, we just pray that you be with anybody that's not involved in some sort of some sort of work or Father, some activity that would bring you honor and glory that, that they would also be get involved. Father, would just be with us and again help us to love you to the point that, that you first loved us and sent us your son to suffer and die for our sins. It is in his precious name we pray, amen. Number 96, please. I stand in awe. We'll see how, how well we can cooperate. When we get down to the frame, you see how it says, and I stand, I stand in all of you. Let's stand when we get to the refrain, okay? At the appropriate place. <laughs> You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful comprehension, my nothing ever seen or heard, who can grasp your you that gave me goosebumps <clears throat> number 350 for the song before our, our Lord's Supper number 350 when my love for Christ grows weak when my love to Christ grows weak when for deeper faith I see Wow. 
in my love for man grows weak when for stronger faith I seek Hill of Calvary I go to thy scenes of fear and woe there beyond his agony suffered on the bitter tree this time we'll prepare our emblems for the Lord's Supper. As we're preparing these emblems, let's try to block out any worldly care or concerns that we have and focus our hearts and minds on the great sacrifice that the Lord made for us. Also, if we have any sin hidden in the recesses of our hearts, let's bring those to the Lord, that we may ask forgiveness of that, that we may take these emblems with a pure heart. At this time, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on this same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself for discerning the Lord's body. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and Holy Father God, we thank you for the great love that you showed us by sending your only Son down from heaven, where he willingly left his glory there, Father, to come to this earth and live a perfect life and to willingly lay his life down at the cross to pay for our sin debt. We ask, Father, that you help us to always be mindful of that great sacrifice and to live our lives for your kingdom, Father. Please help us to live a life that will be acceptable to you when we die. Father, as we take this bread, which represents Christ's body there at Calvary, we ask that you help us to do so in a manner that is pleasing unto you. We pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Now, we'll partake of the fruit of the vine, which we know represents to us as Christians the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. So with those things in mind, let us pray. 
Father, we thank you for the blessing of your son and the gift that you give. For his willingness, Father, to go to that cross, to shed his life-giving blood, Father, that we might have life. Losing his own, he saved us. The blood now flows over us, Father, in the kingdom. And we pray that each one partaking of this through the vine this morning remembers that their Lord, Jesus, shed his blood for them. In his name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. It's a convenient time now for us to also hinder another act of worship, which is to lay by in stores that we've been prospered, as we're instructed to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. So at this time, we'll have a prayer before we begin. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the blessings of life, for your bountiful hand that flows so readily to us, Father, in all things that we have. We simply pray as we give back at this time to that we would do so with loving and cheerful hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. The psalm before the lesson this morning is number 490, 490. If, this, if there's a theme song or a song that we need to rally around today, I believe it's this one right here, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my But 
Thank you, Clayton. Kate did a great job picking out songs for the most part, didn't he? So, appreciate you being with us this morning. If you're visiting, we're especially happy to have you with us, and I've had a chance to talk to a few of our visitors, and it looks like the Greers are pretty well lined up a pew there. It's good to see y'all up here visiting, and I know uh, Grandma and Grandpa are very happy, too, so great to have y'all with us. It's good to see some that have been sick back with us, and it's just good to have visitors all the way from different parts of the world. I think we have a visitor here from Arkansas, I heard. Is that correct? Yeah, there's one right there. We are glad you are here. This morning's lesson, we're going to talk about something that's very dear to me, and it, it has been an experience. Let me put it that way. And we've had experience for quite a while, Kathy. I keep saying 46 years. She keeps saying it's more, but I'm stopping there. But we've had a number of years of experience with this word that we're looking at on the screen, marriage. And oftentimes when we think about marriage, we think about its challenges and all of the benefits and all the wonderful things about it. Then, unfortunately, sometimes the sadness that comes along with losing somebody that we have been a part of for a number of years uh, and their marriage then has come to its end. And then unfortunately we often hear about those who decide to end their marriage and that's unfortunate as well, especially if it's for an improper reason. And as we look at scripture, it's interesting that Jesus speaks about the, the marriage that we read about that was instituted by God in scripture. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And we're going to learn some things that's going to help us in our marriage. Now, marriage is a major part, as we've tried to illustrate, of everyday life. And this is the time of year people start thinking about marriage and when they can have a marriage and so forth. And there'll be a lot of June marriages. And, and of course, there'll be some in May and then July and then you can list all the rest of the months, and there's reasons people find to get married in those months, too. And as we mo all know, marriage starts with the wedding. I was just about to say we both know, Kathy and I know, that marriage starts with the wedding. For those of you that were here when Kathy and I got married, I didn't know I needed to come early, so I waited till the exact time to start, right, Bob? And everybody was wondering if the groom was going to show up. But I knew that marriage started with the wedding, so I, I planned to be there. 
And also learn something else. Marriage doesn't end when the cake is gone. Have you noticed that? Marriage just keeps going on from there. And of course, the cake's the sweet part, right? But there's a lot of other sweet parts of marriage and sometimes some bitter. In fact, I want to tell you a story about a young boy that goes to his dad in the hearing of mom. And this young boy has, is, a, is a ten, about a 10 year old and he's just now got a girlfriend and he's thinking about marriage. And so he goes to dad and he says, dad, would you please tell me what marriage is like? Well, when that question was asked, Dad saw that Mom was in the room. And so he says, I'm going to make an impression on my wife. He said, marriage is like a walk in the park. It's full of beautiful flowers, some nice gentle sloping hills, creeks that are flowing, birds that are singing, and just goes on and on how beautiful the park is in relating to marriage. And of course, this put a smile on mom's face, but also on the 10-year-old boy. He's still thinking about his girlfriend. But later that evening, when mom and dad are alone, mom says to herself, I need to have a talk with dad. She says, honey, you got that part right. Marriage is like a walk in the park, but you got the wrong park. It's like Jurassic Park. <laughs> Need I say any more? Marriage is a challenge. But it's been going on for a long time. Jesus reveals to us that marriage was a part of life in Noah's day where they ate and they drank and they married wives. And I think that's significant, by the way. And as we look at these scriptures, notice genders that's involved. They married wives and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Marriage was in, in motion in the, in the days of Noah, but when the flood came, things would change. But as Matthew reveals in verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And then what happened then? Marriage ended because Noah's sons were already married. And so marriage came to an end with the flood. Why? Because those flood waters overcame those folks that were not in the ark. But we know what happened. Marriage resumed with Noah's children and their offspring, and it remains to this day a real part of life. In fact, in Luke 20, verse 34, we read the words of Jesus. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry." and are given in marriage. And sons have been given in marriage, and daughters have been given in marriage since then. And we all remember if we've attended a wedding recently, or remember maybe our own wedding, who gives this wife or this woman to be married? And it's usually a daddy who says, her mother and our credit card. <laughs> Something like that. Her mother and I. And sons are given, daughters are given, and marriage becomes a reality in life. And Jesus even spoke in Matthew 10 when asked about marriage. From the beginning of creation, but from the beginning of creation, Jesus said, God made them male and female. And when God made male and female, he designed them to be together. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, we read the words, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, Dan Johnson has a great story y'all need to hear, so ask him about the rib of the man when you get a chance. He'll, I'm sure, be glad to tell it to you. And if not, I think Christy could probably tell it, couldn't you, Christy? But it's interesting that, that God chose to do it this way. 
We know that God created from man from the dust of the earth, but, but he takes his rib. And why did God do that? Did Adam need one less rib than woman? Did you know for years that people thought that men had one less rib than women? And that was taught in religious institutions. Except for things didn't work out quite that way. So the question is asked, did Adam have one less rib than Eve? Do men have one less rib than a woman? Well, the answer is no. Couple reasons we don't have to worry about being shorter rib, guys, is because God designed the genetics that were passed on with the offspring. Another interesting fact that I found out, and I confirmed this with Dan this morning just to make sure I was on the right track because all the information I could gather seemed, uh, seemed to be the, the same information. But a research team from USC, uh, that is the University of Southern California, wrote a report, and they, they reported that humans and mice are able to regrow removed ribs. And I never thought about that until I got to reading this. I thought, wow. And, it, and, and what's interesting is that it happens within a matter of months. The rib, in fact, is the only bone in our body that can regenerate itself. When the researchers remove rib sections and a surrounding sheath of tissue called the perichondrium, the missing rib sections fail to repair itself even after nine months. But, or as the, the information goes on, when they remove the rib but left in its perichondrium, the missing rib entirely repaired itself with, within one or two months. So, Ron, you do not have anything to worry about. But whether Adam grew a new rib or his offspring because of God's designed genetics produced the, the rib and the offspring matters not, does it? Except what matters is that God wanted to show man the value of that woman and that she had a rightful place in his life. Notice what Adam says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. There's the important matter, isn't it? Eve was a part of Adam's life. And what happens when a male and female get together? They become a real part of each other's life. And it's interesting in Genesis 2 that we read, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In Mark 10, it is clear that marriage is a design for male and female. It's God's plan. God made them male and female. And in verse 7 we read, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. They enter into a very special, and I will add the word sacred, relationship. And Jesus makes this clear. It's a very special relationship. And it's interesting as we look at John 3, John the Baptist is speaking, but he reveals something very, very important that I think our society needs to hear today. In verse 29, John 3, we read, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Now that's an interesting phrase because when you look at it in the original language, the word bride and the word bridegroom, referring to the male, is very similar. You can see here, you don't have to know Greek to know anything about this, but you will notice the similarities. If you look at the word bride in red and go up a little bit, you'll see the word. And then if you look at the bridegroom, you'll see the word. And they're very, very similar. Do you know what defines them? It's the ending of the word that the inspired writers wrote, which indicate feminine and masculine, male and female. And you'll notice there, the feminine, the female, is who? The bride, and the male is the bridegroom. And that's how it's used in Scripture. So I think that is very, very significant when you recognize the marriage design as the plan of God. In fact, it's also interesting when you go to Matthew 25 and verse 1, where Jesus gives a parable describing the kingdom of heaven. 
It shall be likened to ten virgins. And these are essentially bridesmaids. Five were prepared, five were not. Five had oil in their lamp, five did not. And so when the news of the bridegroom coming was announced, five were ready, five were not, and five were shut out of the wedding, and Jesus makes the point that we must be prepared. But there's another aspect of this. Notice that you have the contrast, ten virgins, and then you have the bridegroom, or we would just say the groom. And what happens when a man and woman become one in marriage? Well, Scripture reveals they become one in flesh, but it's not just any Scripture. It's a number of Scriptures, and including the words of Jesus. And the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one. Paul explains what that one flesh means. If you want to take the time to go ahead and, and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 and 16 particularly, but he describes how that happens, how they become one flesh. And that's significant to know, it's important to know, particularly in the aspect of a relationship between male and female. But what is significant this morning that I want you to understand that it's God's plan that a man and woman enter into marriage and become one, one in flesh. As Mark 10, verse 9 points out, therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Do you think that's a message that our world needs to hear today? You see, we've got a lot of folks that have decided marriage is not really essential, but I'm telling you, it's God's plan. Part of that plan is the commitment that's made in marriage. Some folks don't want to make that commitment. They just want to get the benefit of being together as one flesh, but they don't really want to commit to the marriage. But God designed marriage to be the place for one flesh. And when two people enter into a marriage relationship, they're participating in God's plan. Man and woman are to join together, and then we're told by Jesus, let not man separate. In fact, the sanctity of that relationship of marriage was brought into question in the context of Matthew 19 and also in Mark 10. As you look at Mark 10, the Pharisees, Scripture says, came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? Matthew records it this way. In Matthew 19, verse 3, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Look what's happened in societies all across the world. People can separate divorce for any reason. And so it's a valid question. What would, would, would Scripture say about this in answer to the question? Well, more importantly, what would Jesus say about it? Here's what Jesus said. He said to them, because they were talking about the law of Moses, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But look at this. But from the beginning, it was not so. What beginning? All the way back, what happened? God made man, he made woman, and he made them to be joined together to become one flesh. And that is the beginning where God set forth the plan for the world. And even though it stopped for a while, with the destruction of the world under Noah, it resumed and that was God's plan that continued down even to the time of Jesus and exists today. And so therefore, in Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus said, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And that is significant to understand. And a lot of folks don't hear this verse very often, but they need to. No, particularly if they're entering into marriage. Whenever I participate in, in the marriage ceremony, and we have some, a couple here that could tell you from just recently, we discussed this in our counseling session. But this marriage that you're about to enter into is for life. 
Jesus gave us only one exception, which allows for divorce. And so don't even think about that. Think about the commitment you're going to make to be together forever and ever. 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 60, 70, 80, if you last that long. What's all that about? Commitment. A commitment to one another. In fact, you really can't get it any plainer than Jesus made it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. When he spoke, and these are his words. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce, referencing what was being done by the Jews under the old law. He says, but I say to you, and this is what counts today, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Those are the words of our Lord. And why did he speak those words? Because marriage is sacred and it's binding. How many of you have ever bought a new car that wished you hadn't? And you go look at that car and boy, you're excited. Wow, well, look at the color of that. Man, do you see how those wheels just spin around like all four at the same time? Did you notice how that car smells like a new car? And wow, think about this. That odometer's got only 10 miles on it. Wow, I've never seen that before. Got to have it. How much is this car? And the salesman says, $35,000. Boy, it's got four wheels that go around at the same time. Look at that. Okay, let's buy it. He writes the contract, and then he gets down to the bottom. He says, how much do you want to put down? Oh, I'll put $5,000 down. And he writes down, right down. He says, sign here. And you sign, because you're excited. It's got four wheels that go around and around. It's only got 10 miles on the odometer. Wow. Then it's time for that first big Big payment, right? Oh, but it's got four wheels that go round and round. Ten miles on the odometer. And next month, what do you have? Time to write that payment out. Or it comes out of your bank nowadays. Before long, what happens? You're not very happy about your commitment. Some people treat marriage like that. Boy, Kathy was young and just the right person for me. She only had 10 miles in all four of her feet. <laughs> Went round and round. <laughs> but you know what happens in marriage after several years? Start thinking about that commitment. And I'm thankful we've kept ours. What God has joined together, Scripture says, out of the mouth of Jesus were the words spoken, let not man separate. Folks, marriage is sacred. It's binding by the very words of Jesus. Interesting enough, in Luke chapter 20, I'll move right on because our time's away from us. Then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and, and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that a man is... If a man's brother dies and having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring to his brother. That's in the law of Moses. Verse 29 reads, Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife. So they're going to give Jesus a scenario here. Seven brothers, first took a wife, died without children. Second took her as a wife, and he died childless. Third took her, and in like manner seven also, and they left no children and died. So they asked the question in reference to the story, or actually make the statement, last of all, the woman died also. Then the question, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? 
For all seven had her as wife. Now they think that Jesus is in a trap. He's not going to be able to answer because they don't believe in the resurrection and they think they've got Jesus now. They feel like they've grabbed hold of a contradiction and now Jesus can't answer. We'll show him. We can imagine a poor woman having seven brothers, never having children. That'd be kind of a challenge anyway. But look how Jesus answers. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. How many of you have seen the movie Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? It's kind of an interesting, cute movie about the challenge of finding wives for brothers. But it's really not about the brothers. It's about the tragedy of the Sadducees not knowing the truth of God's word. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. They've built their whole argument on that which is false. You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. You see, they assumed there was going to be marriage in heaven. Now, if you start looking for that verse, I don't think you're going to find it. And that's what Jesus makes clear. So their trap was not a trap at all. But what does it tell us? It tells us that heaven is going to be so wonderful, we're not going to need what we need on this earth, the companionship that God designed for man and woman. Why? Because as you see heaven unfolded for us in the book of Revelation and other places, what kind of relationship do we have? We have a wonderful place where there's no tears, where God is at the center of the life that exists there. And we can't even really, at least in my mind, imagine how wonderful it's going to be to exist in that which God has designed for us there. But that's a different age. In fact, in Luke 20, verse 35, we read the words of Jesus. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age, it's going to be different than on this earth. They had assumed you got married here, we're going to have it in heaven. But Jesus cleared that problem up right away. Often we'll tell couples who are thinking about divorce, just wait, you'll get out of marriage when you get to heaven. In that age, it's going to be different. The resurrection from the dead and either marrying or giving in marriage. But there's something I want us to focus on as we end this lesson this morning. Notice what we read in the words of Christ in verse 35. But those who are counted worthy, those who are counted worthy will do what? They'll attain that age. For in they're going to be with God forever and ever and talk about a marriage made in heaven that's going to be one as revelation 19 reveals it's going to be a place where we're going to participate with the results of what god did when he sent christ on the cross which enabled us to be a part of the marriage of the lamb and as we move on in verse 8 it says unto her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright what happens to us when we're washed in that watery grave of baptism? We're made white in the blood of the Lamb. We're purified. And of course, here then it talks about the righteous acts of the saints. And then verse 9 gives us a beautiful conclusion. And he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who's worthy? Those who have given their life to Jesus. Those who have, like John, obeyed the plan of salvation. It's simple, it's plain, but it must be obeyed. Because we have that opportunity to continue to believe, continue to repent, continue to stand up for Jesus, continue to benefit from that blood that flows from Calvary. And in doing so, we look forward to the benefit 
of being there at the marriage feast. And who is that for? It's prepared for all who will surrender to Jesus their lives. We marry one another, but yet there's a greater marriage to keep in sight, and that's our marriage that we have opportunity to do if we obey the gospel to be married to Christ by surrendering our lives and being willing to sacrifice for Jesus. How about you this morning? Who are you committed to? I hope it's our Lord. And if not, we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation song, and if we can assist you in any way, please make that known as we stand and sing. Would you come? If you would, be seated. The preacher's not done. <laughs> if you have a, a bulletin, you might look at the front page. It's a good teaching moment I want to share with you. When I selected the picture, I didn't notice it too closely. I thought the lady in, uh, here it looked like she was asking a question, but as the more I got to looking at it a while ago, it looks like maybe she's got her hands lifted up, which sometimes you're seeing if you watch... Uh, denominational churches, you'll see people raising up their hands, or if you, uh, maybe I've even seen it happen in, 
in the, the church where maybe you have a new convert, and so we're going to assume she's probably a new convert, hopefully. Uh, and in reference to the lesson, I actually was going to fit it into the lesson because one of the things that happens with societies is they neglo- neglect, of course, what God says. They don't even know. But also in religious circles, people forget that words are important. And if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 6, I'll look at it for sure. Uh, verse 8. Paul wrote to the church there through Timothy, and he's explaining this to Timothy. Timothy, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And the word he uses there is the word for male. It's a male. It's a man. His desire is that, that men lift up holy hands. And, of course, as you look at the passage, it's, it's often considered that it is in reference to their lives and their hearts. But you see a lot of times people do this physically. And so I'm just going to assume the lady in the picture, either not she's a new convert and doesn't know better, or she hasn't been taught properly. And if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to talk to me. But it is interesting because it is important that we do pay attention to the words. And particularly when it comes to marriage and our walk in Christ, our faithfulness. And if you ever have any questions about some of the words, then feel free to contact me or Bob or anybody else here, the elders. I know they'll be happy to visit with you on that. Now, one more thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. We're going to be taking, right after the, the, the assembly this morning, we're going to be taking goods for Ukraine up to uh, water mill. And if you would like to... Contribute to that. One, there'll probably be another opportunity, but if you want to get in on it today, we've got to go pick up a, a few things after we load here. And, it, and if you want to contribute, I will make a stop at Walmart here in Marshville. So if you want to go on over there, if you maybe you didn't bring anything, you haven't been prepared, the list is in, on Facebook, or Julie can tell you the list, or I can tell you the list, Kathy can tell you. If you do want to get some things, we'll make a stop at Walmart in that, that uh, van and pick up a whatever you might have that you might want to send to water mill, and we'll, we'll go over on the side with the gardening. We'll look for you over on the side with the gardening stuff. So if you want to go to Walmart, get some things that will go to Ukraine. And one of the things that Julie told me yesterday, and correct me, Julie, if I got this wrong, but money doesn't do them any good because they don't have anything to buy over there. So that's why an effort... because they want the good specifically. And I'm, we're assuming that that's the reason. And from what I've watched on some of the online videos in Ukraine itself, it's just not, they're even taking the stuff out of the stores that's been left. So you can imagine it's a difficult situation. But anyway, they do want the goods that's on that list. And so we will go, after we make our load here and, and our uh, pickups, we will go to the Walmart if you want to go on over there and get some things. If not, we'll, we'll do it again, I'm sure, because the need's going to be ongoing for a while but just wanted to, to make you know that but if you do go to Walmart we'll look for you over on the uh, gardening side in the parking lot uh, till up till this evening like if you're going to Springfield at about what the five o'clock is when they begin their evening worship so, yeah well, not really. The, the, you'll need to make a phone call if you want. If you go any time other than the afternoon, uh, you'll need to call and let, let them know you're there. If that makes sense. And Julie can fig in on that later. Any other questions? Okay, good. Thank you. I do know that the Mountain Home Church is also doing the same thing. We're doing it together. A lot of them are doing it with Mountain Home Church. Okay. Right. And the reason why Mountain Home is very in, increasing that work in, you know, for the, with the missionary in Pickett. And so and they're going there. And so if you'd like to, if you, if you miss this one, send it to Mountain Home. They'll, they'll, they'll make sure it gets there as well. Um, one last song, number 250 250. Be our closing song. You'll ask Brother Daniel to come and lead us in our closing prayer at that time. You would please let's stand again for this final song and and for our closing prayer. Now I love the great Redeemer who is doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story of the love that makes men free. Till Crystal sea, more and more.
Let that be the last one for you. Brother Daniel. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we truly thank you, Father, for the avenue of prayer that you've blessed us with. We thank you for prayers that you answer on our behalf. Father, we ask for and pray for any forgiveness of sin in our lives that you might hear and answer those prayers that we send up. Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine and worldwide that are being impacted. Father, we pray for an end to this war, if it be your will, soon. Father, we pray for the men and women that are in our military. Father, we pray for safety and protection for them and blessings upon them and their family. Father, we thank you for the lesson that we had this morning. Father, we pray that you would bless our marriages and, Father, future marriages of kids and grandkids. Father, that we would, in all situations, look to your word to see what is right and see what your will is. Father, we thank you for Brother Rick and Kathy. We thank you for our elders and our deacons. Father, we thank you for all those who labor so much here in our congregation. We pray for your continued blessings upon all of our members. Father, we pray for your blessings on those visiting with us and pray that you give them safe travels back home. Father, we're thankful for the decision that John has recently made and also Brother Daniel. Father, all those who have put on Christ through baptism, we're so thankful for that. Pray your blessings upon them. Father, we pray that as we leave here that you would continue to guide, guard, direct us in all of our ways. Father, we pray that we would be that beacon of light to this lost world that is around us. Father, we pray for all those who are struggling spiritually, emotionally, or physically, that your healing hand, strength, and comfort be upon us all. We're thankful for prayers answered on those who have been away. Continue to pray for Wanda and Marvin Clark. And Father, we're thankful for Janet being here and Roy today and others. Father, pray you continue to be with all those on our prayer list. Father, we thank you for every blessing. Most of all, we thank you for the greatest blessing we'll ever know, your son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen.